Hello there, Sir from 17 once again. This is my Evil West, Evil Difficulty video walkthrough. This is Chapter 8, it's called Pharmacon. And we're doing a little bit of an interim here, coming back to the bar to pick up some gold and look around. Got a comment on one of my videos saying that uh, I should play on console because the camera is too erratic on my videos. And uh, I thought it was really funny because the word erratic, if you look it up by its definition, can mean a few things, but one of them is unpredictable. And I find it really funny that somebody can think that my camera movement is unpredictable when I'm moving the camera. <laughs> Anybody else find that as funny as me? Rather delicious. See, what he was meaning to say is that my camera movements are quite fast and they're, they're quite sudden. And if you're watching it, it might be a bit startling to you if you play on low sensitivity because I move my camera very quickly. And I, I can appreciate somebody that doesn't like that. But what I can't appreciate is somebody telling me to change my life choices so that they mirror their life choices. That to me just sounds entitled and pretty dickish. So... I don't really know what that guy was getting at, because I think it's really funny that the way they framed that comment was, don't play on PC because the camera is erratic. You do realise you can use controller on PC, you can use low sensitivity on PC, like, you don't have to have a fast camera. You can have a fast camera on, on console, you can use mouse and keyboard on console, like, it, it, the ignorance in the comment is so profound when you analyse it that, it, like, you just fall off your chair if you think too hard. <laughs> but what a hero. What a beast. Guy just came in there like, I like this, fuck you. And that's the end of it. More power to him, right? Freedom of speech and all that. But we... Now we have to assess William Rentier's condition. And... After that, we're going to be going to... I think it's like a green swamp area. And it must be said, there were a couple of expectations I had coming into Evil West. The first one was that there was going to be more vampires. And that's a huge criticism of mine, actually. This game doesn't have that many vampires for it being such a vampire-centric game. And I suppose you could say that they're demon hunters or devil hunters or monster hunters, but they really put an emphasis on the anti-vampiric stuff, right? And if you think about it, you've got the big bat guy, who's a boss who turns up way too much, You've got the, the like, scrawny, like, Nosferatu geezers. And then you've got the, the priest guy, haven't you, at the end with the hat on. They're vampires. But, like, the big beefy guys, are they vampires too, do you think? The butcher men, butcher vampires, they might be vampires, I guess. But there's a lot of the leechy stuff, and the, like, bloated people. And these are werewolves, obviously. Now, if these are vampire werewolves, then my critique is dead in the water, and that means something entirely different, and I'm all for this. But I don't think these guys are vampire werewolves. I don't think they're, uh, vamp wolves. Weirpires? I don't know how you would even say that. But what I do know is this is when you're going to start seeing me use the zapper a lot. Because this enemy, if you don't use the zapper, can evade a ton, and there's a lot of them. Like, if it's just three wolves, I'll have fun with the wolves and counterpunch them, but when there's more than that and there's more spawns, I ain't even gonna fuck with it. I'm just gonna shut them down completely. And the weakness of the wolf is when you knock them down. If you knock them down, you get to do really fun things to them. One of the things you can do is Quake, and I'm not gonna use Quake in this playthrough, guys. I wanted to save my batteries for the superpowered mode to test it, and it turned out to be very successful, but you're not going to see too much experimentation with Quake, so if you watch the videos going like, why are you not using Quake? I don't have it. And additionally, guys, I respec a couple times in this run too, because I wanted to experiment with some high level upgrades, and some of them ended up being worse than I thought they would be. So the two that I'm going to warn you about, and you can use them if you'd like, the first one is the railgun on the rifle. The rifle railgun turns the rifle into a, a charge weapon now, but it changes the timing of the shooting. It makes the shooting feel a little bit more delayed. And I'm so autistic, I don't like it. So I had to remove it as soon as I bought it. I didn't like it at all. Also, it takes an eternity to charge, and you can only fire it when you get a full charge. So if you roll, you lose the charge, and it's just pointless. And then the second one is the explosive device. There's an explosive that causes a tornado. And the tornado is so bad. It is so bad. It blinds you so much, you will get hit through it. 
Like, I had bosses zooming through the tornado and hitting me. I had jump attacks hitting me through tornadoes. I had all kinds of bullshit. So I ended up turning it off completely. And the sad thing is, it's really good. The damage seemed really good. It looks awesome, but you can't see. And in a game like this, being able to see is more important than being able to attack. Because your visibility is going to save your ass. It's how you live. And speaking of how you live, you now have access to the crossbow, which is one of my favourite weapons in the game. Do not sleep on this crossbow. I saw reviewers saying that there's no reason to swap between the guns because they didn't see a point. I'm telling you right now, guys, there's a real good point. So, your rifle is good. It's really good, it's really precise, it's kind of slow. If you shoot all your rounds in your rifle, you need to reload it and wait for that cooldown. But if you swap to the crossbow, you have a full clip of crossbow to do the same thing your rifle was doing, but it does it quicker. You now can swap between two different guns to always capitalize on weak points and capitalize on damage. And that's not mentioning when you upgrade the crossbow to get the double bolts and when you get the electricity on it, this thing is capable of doing more damage than your punch combos on bosses. And I wish I didn't say that because I wish that wasn't true, but Evil West giveth and Evil West taketh away. I shit you not, the final boss, guys, takes more damage from a barrage from that crossbow than it does if you do perfectly timed full hit strings on them. I don't know why it works like that, and I think that that's awful, but that's the game we're playing, and you have to respect the game, right? Speaking of respecting the game, this is another one of those fights where understanding the game is going to be really useful, and just then is one of my favourite things because it makes me think of God Hand. So when you do a cannonball, guys, you get a weird iframe. And sometimes you'll get hit, and sometimes you'll trade, and sometimes it won't work, but sometimes it will. The more you play, the more you'll get a feeling for that. When you do a cannonball at the right timing, you can go through ground shock waves, you can go through jump attacks, you can go through a lot of things, and it feels awesome. However, when it doesn't work, it feels awful. So, word to the wise. Be very careful using cannonball in high risk situations. I love doing it though. It makes me think of doing the, the follow up to the aerial attack in God Hand. And I'd love to know if this game has any God Hand influences. Because everybody's going to say that this game is ripping off God of War 2018. And little did they know, that perspective, that whole idea, came f many years before that reboot. And it has been done considerably better, because I hate to be that guy to point this out, and most of you probably already know this, but the combat in God Hand is better than God of War 2018 and God of War Ragnarok combined. That is an objective fact. That is not subjective. That is not opinion. That is carved on lithographs beyond time. And it's known as truth. And this fight is just a bunch more leech people whose names I do not have yet. I should get their names between this and the next video, right? Get some names for you. I love the shotgun, dude. Let's talk about cooldown, shall we? So we have a... We have this glorious zapper that enables us to do things that are ab absurdly powerful, and it has no cooldown. You could give it a cooldown, and I wouldn't think that was a bad thing. I'd actually like that, because then people wouldn't be able to exploit it. But you don't have a cooldown on it. Then you have all these other tools that have pretty strict cooldowns. So your shotgun has a cooldown. Your dynamite has a cooldown. Your gatling gun has a cooldown. Your flamethrower has a cooldown. Your crippling rod has a cooldown. Everything has a cooldown, right? Potentially. Some more arbitrary than others. Some more labored than others. There doesn't seem to be a way to spec your character to make any of the cooldowns any better other than something like healing. And I think they missed a trick here. Because if you could build your Jesse so that you favoured one particular skill, but some of the other skills were compromised in some way, I think that that would have been a wonderful risk versus reward, playstyle versus preference kind of thing, you know? And, and I would have loved to have focused on certain aspects of my kit. Like, can you imagine if you could pick two tools, but the rest of your tools take some kind of negative? I'd do that. Because there are tools that I don't use as much, and there are tools that I use purely as support. I would happily take a bit of a handicap on stuff. Like, can you imagine, guys, if there was a perk that completely disabled healing, but powered up all of your other gear? How awesome would that be? 
if you could just get rid of the healing ability and give yourself like a 25% damage boost. That to me would be so cool. But I have to talk about stalkers. And I only know that guy's name because that handy tooltip just then that you can't turn off even though you turn combat assistance off and it still gives them you. Apparently though on New Game Plus they don't exist. This is the worst enemy in the game. And it's not for any reason other than the web. Like, I don't want to say this enemy's bad. I like him. I love this fight. I think this fight's fun. But this guy has something that you're not going to see here that makes him so much worse than anything else. And it's the spider on his back. The spider on his back has two weak points. And if you shoot them, I think that's it. I think he starts being melee like he's doing right. I don't know what he's doing right now. He's having a bad day. But this game is quite buggy. It's going to happen. One thing you won't see as well, guys, is I don't tend to capitalize on the electrical stun once I build the, the stun meter. It's not because I don't want to. It's just because I was trying not to use the zapper too much. And the easiest way to proc that counter is with the zapper. I don't even use it on some of the boss fights. I use it on the final boss, though, because the final boss I found to be incredibly terrible. And we get some werewolves now, so we can do some fun things. But this enemy can fire web at you. And the web it fires at you has a really questionable hitbox. It also has a lingering effect, so the web will stay where it is. And if you move through the web, you get connected to it, and it impedes your mobility. When you roll, you still can't get away. When you roll again, you still can't get away. And then when you roll like the third time, you seem to be able to get out of it. I think what they wanted you to do is to use the flamethrower to burn the web. But I use the flamethrower so much in my combos that I rarely have the flamethrower to do that. So when he immobilizes you, the game becomes unfair. And I'm going to talk more about this later on because he's going to turn up with some enemies and he's going to fire web at you while you fight all these other enemies. This was me being confused. I figured out why I was confused here too. I didn't understand why I'm doing weird things when I'm blocking. It's because I'm zapping towards him by accident because I'm holding block even though you're not supposed to do that. And uh, I couldn't make any sense of what was happening. I thought the game was being weird. Turns out it was just me doing something by accident. So I'm just like trying to see if I can recreate it and it felt very strange. In a very rare occurrence as well, this level's way longer than I thought it was. So I'd edited the sequence incorrectly and it continues after this cutscene. So we get to see even more of it, which is even better. And I quickly just checked on the bestiary of the game. There are a lot of enemies, and they all have a lot of names. So, because there's no convenient page on the internet that has everything on it yet, I'm not going to be calling anything by its name, because I'd have to make a document for this to work, and I don't have the time, because I'm really busy at the moment. <laughs> so, unfortunately... I know this guy's name, though. He's called Gaurau, or Gaurog, or something. This guy's a God of War guy, or a Gears of War guy, depending on which way you lean. I call him Mole, because that's kind of who he is. And if you're really aggressive here, you can kill him before any of the trouble starts. And then you can take on these people. But it was kind of interesting to find out that, for instance, the, the bat vampire that appears too, too much. <laughs> he is called a, a highborn. He's like the highest born vampire. He's the highest sangue sugabog, or whatever they call these monsters in this game. And these guys are, are called infected, and then they have subnames. So one of them is the Infected Proteus, which is a really cool name. A lot of cool names in this, actually. Interesting, too. It shows as well who are the familiars and who are the monsters and who are the vampires. And some of the things that I thought were vampires aren't even vampires. They're something else, which is quite cool. But it's worth looking at. And additionally, if you go into the lore, guys, you find the mission select that I said wasn't in the game. And a friend of mine thought wasn't in the game as well, who even reviewed the game and critiqued it for not having a mission select because they've hidden it in the law, which is very strange. But it's a good time to be wrong because at least we have mission select now. And if I'd known, I when I softlocked my game, I would have been able to restart the mission. I just never found it. It's one of those things I would have never looked in law for mission select. It's just not something I would have thought to do. Like, I haven't even been picking law up on this run because it's a walkthrough, you know? That's a tab that would have remained unchecked. But alas, here we are. And this level is going to be introducing a new gimmick. Which is the idea of these stone platforms on the ground. Which if you step on them for too long, they start to hurt you. And that's one of the areas of this level where I take some damage. 
because I I didn't try to, to navigate it where I never took damage from the floor because I was just trying to get you know to where I wanted to be but if you look there apparently the Maya has toxic fumes and these areas have been designed in such a way that you can navigate them without worrying too much but for instance here going to get that gold without taking a hit I don't really know if you can do that because it doesn't seem like there's another way there and if you want to do no damage on this level, you just don't pick that gold up. It's not the end of the world. If you've got all the upgrades, you don't need bloody gold. But I took a hit just then, and that's technically damage. So the rest of this video is just gravy, baby. Just no healing. And this is the level that introduces a mechanic where we have to find some rope. And I think I mentioned this earlier on. This is one of the, the gimmicky moments in the game that I don't like as much. Because you can't do it out of sequence. So you can't go and grab the rope, which I think is really silly. Like what this is another one like how do you get this without getting hit somebody probably knows how to do that but I don't and I've got no real interest because no damage should be the fights it shouldn't be the fucking exploration you know what are we no hit runners in Dark Souls trying to get famous on AGDQ streams no we're not those people those people can keep doing that and doing cool things because people love that we're, we're doing something else but I do like that they gave you an environmental hazard in as much as this level is easily the longest level in the game. But it's the longest level in the game because it seems to have the most navigation. And that stuff right there, when you shoot the debris to make a raft, I think that's great. I would have liked to see more of that. I also quite like the, those where you have to destroy the, the glamours and it involves shooting things. Like This game is at its best, in my opinion, when you are shooting things. I think that's where it does its best work. It's just, unfortunately, they had a bit of a penchant for pushing minecarts and it ended up biting them in the ass on some of the reviews because people have been literally saying that walking with your son in god of war while nothing is happening is more interesting than pushing a minecart and i disagree dude one one review even said that the platforming in shadow warrior 3 was better because at least it had you doing something and i couldn't disagree more because the platforming in shadow warrior 3 was so automated and so brain dead it made fucking assassin's creed look like high execution celeste level you know interaction that's the rope that we're going to need by the way but you can't pick it up and i don't understand why anybody wants to do something that's so brain dead like you know these moments where you climb up this chain this is just a way to link two pieces of geometry together and I don't really judge it too harshly because it's just the way the game is made. It's simple, it does its job, it's equivalent of a door in a Resident Evil back in the day. That's all it is. If you overthink it, it is lame, you know, they could have come up with more creative ways, but fundamentally it's just a necessary chink in a chain, that's all it is. The difference here is the platforming in, in Shadow Warrior could have been really fun and really interesting, but they were so terrified that apparently you have no hands, that they made it the most brain-dead easy platforming in the world, and the only the only reason you'll mess it up is when the game doesn't populate the fucking world, and you jump into a void that checkpoints, and then you get a permadeath checkpoint where you keep falling into a void, and it softlocks the level. That happened to me on that very fucking game, by the same dev as this one, you know? They are prone to the odd glitch every so often, but... I just can't imagine wanting to do platforming when the platforming is so lobotomized that you might as well be in a slow walking sequence or a fucking cutscene. Because that's what you're doing. The difference is, they're trying to mask it with spectacle. They're trying to mask it with speed lines on the screen. They're trying to mask it with wall running. Like, do you really want a wall run when the wall run doesn't feel good? I don't. That's why I didn't play fucking Fallen Order. Wall running in that game was terrible. You look like Forrest Gump as a child in calipers with a full nappy and it was horrendous in every conceivable way. 9 out of 10, absolutely making a sequel. Yay. It's just, I don't get why anybody wants to do something that used to be great that's now been homogenized to the extent that it's meaningless. And in many ways, that's video games, isn't it? Modern video games are blinding you with special effects to convince you that what you're doing is something worthwhile when in reality you're just queuing at a fancy ATM. This fight is really hard by the way. I had a lot of difficulty with this one and it's just because it's very demanding and there's multiple layers and this is kind of what Evil West does a lot and you're either gonna like these encounters or you're gonna struggle and, and find them annoying and some of them work really well some of them not so much the reason this one is particularly difficult is because of the way that they script the post spawns. 
but you can do a lot of manipulation here guys and it's kind of interesting and this is something you want to experiment with a lot especially if you're having trouble certain enemies have to be executed to die and certain enemies when they die they are triggers for enemy waves so if you fight a, a group the right way and if you kill them in the right order you can end the fight before several waves turn up because you can sequence break if you do not do what the developers intended or thought you would do. And this is something that's going to save your ass in a few encounters and I'm going to point them out. Because right now, we have a mole and we have uh, the guy who's constantly firing the ground shockwave at us. So here, I think if you kill the guy with the shield right now, it spawns a bunch of ads. It spawns flyers, it spawns those uh, guys that run up to you and blow up. However, if you leave him over there and you fight the mole, I think you end the fight. So I'm just going to 1v1 the mole real quick. And I say real quick, nothing's quick in this game against the elites, against these boss enemies, because they take forever to die. However, this guy, you can stay in his face, do a bunch of standard stuff, and keep using your shotgun and your punches and whatnot. And all you need to do is block his hits, and if you get a parry, all the better. If you don't, it's all good. I should be setting him on fire, but I'm not setting him on fire because I struggled on this fight, so I've gone down to the most safe moveset I can use. But there we go, set him on fire that time. Notice I pushed him back before he could bury himself. The flamethrower is so strong. But do you see how the monster's still alive? He'll never die unless you break him. You have to kill him, and if you don't kill him, you're good to go. So, keep fighting this guy. Keep whacking on him. Trying to get that parry. Stop the three hit combo. Get ready for the grab and kick the grab. Watch out for the instant tunnel into grab, which is my favourite move in the game. Because it looks so funny. And don't sleep on the crossbow. The crossbow is amazing. There he was. Kick him. Punch him. Get a nice weird stutter on your recording. Always fun. And then right there he dies. So right now, there might be a spawn. Hear the bell? That's the bell to tell you the fight's over and it's still spawning enemies. So this is so hard programmed, guys. Even when the toll that tells you the encounter is over happens, enemies will still come. But you'll notice, because this is on a death trigger, you're not being pressured now by these giant bosses, and you can kill these guys at your leisure, and it's really easy. However, if you do this, where you kill the guy and execute him immediately, you will have to contend with this stuff happening while you're fighting the mole. And that's when this game gets really difficult, when you have a lot to contend with. It can be done, of course. It's just hard to do it cleanly. So that's that guy. And I think that's the end of the fight. But I'm just being tentative because I've been here a while. And a while in this game is about 30 minutes, which is not too bad. And then you come over here, you do the same shotgun hit, smash him in the face, and right there it ends the encounter. And you'll notice those flying monsters were not present. The flying monsters kept hitting me, that's why I was having difficulty there. I was getting really frustrated because he kept shooting me from off screen when I was trying to grab them. But this is such a good strategy for all the fights that have multiple death phases. Like if you find an enemy that when he dies triggers a spawn, if you can leave him on his knees and kill everything else, you're going to do yourself a huge favour. But run towards the church, and then once you jump across here, you're going to be able to drop down into the next part of the game but I'm going to go back on myself here because there's some treasure I've missed I think yeah as soon as I see that that's a trigger and I know that's the right way I'm going to go exploring and I recommend that you do the same because you always want to have as much money as possible and some of the reviews that are out there are saying that there's no reason to explore you don't need money because Zappa's so strong try playing on evil difficulty and not having any upgrades see how far you get I'm telling you right now ladies and gentlemen both of the reviews that have the worst reviews I've seen for this game thus far would not be able to beat Evil Difficulty. The reason I know this is one of them started on Hard Difficulty and turned the difficulty down because they were frustrated. And then the other guy is Dreamcast Guy. I don't trust Dreamcast Guy in doing anything that is remotely even close to challenging because of who he is. This is the same person that said Onimusha didn't have a parry. And... That says it all, right, you know? Dreamcast guy is really funny to watch because he's often wrong in almost everything he says, but he seems like a nice dude. However, I think he's way off with this game, and I don't like that he shit on it for no reason. Because you can call a game bad, you can say you don't like it, but when you say it's boring, you do more damage. Because boring is worse. 
And this game is many things, but boring it ain't. And I'm going to be the guy defending it, it seems, because it's not boring, you know? Boring can be subjective. It can be absolutely subjective. But in regards to this one, if you're bored of this game and you just don't like it, why review it? Why put that out there into the universe when it's clear it's not for you, you know? I didn't review Hellblade because I fucking hated it. And I think it's total dog shit. But I don't want to ruin that game for other people that like it. Because it's not fair. So I didn't do that. And I said it shit in this video because this is my video. Fuck you, you know? But like, I don't see the point in going out of your way to bang on something. And I love banging on things. It's my goddamn career right now, talking shit on the internet. It's what I do. But it just seems like it's such a needless thing. And especially... When I like it, you know? Why would you bang on something I like? I'm really important, and you should never bang on things I like, because Jesus is my friend, and I'll get his dad to bully you. But this is a puzzle, this one, and I thought there'd be some fights in this room, and I thought they'd punctuate the puzzle, but they absolutely don't. They let you do this, and I think that's kind of interesting. Coming up, though, is one of the worst enemies in the game. And it's called, I think, like, the Wasp Crone? The Hornet Crone? I struggled so much here on my first playthrough against this monster because I could not get my head around how it was designed. And it's really, really bad. <laughs> it's not fun at all. It's a monster that you wonder who included it. Because its entire purpose is to run away shooting bees at you. And not only does it buff enemies around it and make it so that if you attack them you take passive damage, but it also has a protective shield. And the best part, this is the gravy guys, right? When you finally circumvent what the game wants you to do and you weaken this monster so you can actually attack it, it's really tanky too. And again, this is where I think flying really fall down. This monster is fucking annoying. It's designed to be annoying. But when you stun it, it should die. I don't get that, me. I don't understand why this crappy, flying, like, wizened old bug creature can be just as durable as these giant, fat monsters filled with, like, cushion. It just doesn't make sense. And it doesn't feel satisfying. And you'll be happy to know, guys, I know how to one-cycle this bitch. And I found this strategy because I hate this enemy. And I thought, if I hate this enemy, and I have the patience to fight grads for 20 hours, then there's going to be people out there that hate this enemy just as much as me, and they don't have that patience. So instead, if you come here, guys, with a crippling rod, and the full superpower, all four batteries, or three batteries technically, you can kill this monster without fighting it. And I recommend... Every time this bastard turns up, you do this. Because if you don't, you're chasing him around, shooting eggs while he fires bees at you, and it's really awkward. And I did that. I didn't know about this strategy on my first playthrough. I suffered every fight against this creature, legitimately shooting his eggs and counterpoking him and doing it like four cycles. It might be the worst thing I've ever done in my entire life, you know? It's worse than festival toilets. It's that bad. But it's really strong. And you can just use the crippling rod to get rid of his shield immediately if you want to, or you can shoot it like I'm going to do. I choose to shoot it because I want to show you that you can shoot and dodge, but you need to be really quick on your dodges, because this guy's a pain in the ass. And I like to sprint these moves. He does three barrage barrages, I don't know why I said that weird. And then shoot him, and when he goes down, zap towards him, or don't zap towards him. Set him on fire, do a full burst of the tank, and then go into super mode. There's the shotgun, there's super mode, boom, and now he'll die. As long as that fire takes him down a quarter, you'll beat him. So, I forgot that my loop involves flamethrower too. However, if you have the crippling rod, that can circumvent needing the flamethrower, because you can do a lot of damage to him in the interim. But that is, by far, the most effective way to delete that monster. And uh, Just comment in the, in the comment section. I don't know where else you'd comment, on the toilet wall, in, in the local school, I don't know. But comment, guys, if that helps. Because of all the things I'll show you in this walkthrough, that's the one that will resonate the most if that monster pisses you off as much as it pisses me off. But thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I hope it helps. And you take care now.